So the big question is this, how do passionate golfers like you and I develop a stock shot day in and day out? A stock shot that's as reliable as the sun coming up in the morning. That's the question, and this podcast is the answer. Welcome to Stock Shot Secrets. All right, everybody, welcome back to another episode of Stock Shot Secrets, and I have an amazing, amazing guest today, the godfather of short game and one of my mentors, a basically a legend of golf, um, and Stan Utley, and I cannot say enough good things about you, Stan. I mean, I met Stan, I think we met, I moved out to Arizona in 2008, I think I met you in 2012, maybe, through Ben Boast. Uh, one of our both mutual friends, um, and I would have to say that after meeting you, I don't think going through college golf, you know, I, you know, I had an all right college career or whatever, but Stan basically taught me how to putt the brains out of it, and rightfully so, because this dude's short game is absolutely insane. So, Stan, thank you so much um, for joining me. So, you're in Arizona right now? Is that right? I'm in Scottsdale. Very nice. How's the weather out there? Is it getting a little cold or is it warm? Warming up? It's, we're having a chilly week. So yes, I saw that. The whole country was closed last week for yeah. uh, for spring break. So, but you're not originally from from um, from Scottsdale. Originally from Missouri. So were you? <laughs> unfortunately, your your Missouri Tigers beat beat up on my. Uh, are you a Missouri fan? Beat up on my Buckeyes last week in the in the Cotton Bowl, uh, which I didn't I didn't notice that. <laughs> so um so while being in in missouri right and playing at missouri like just learning and and knowing everything that you've got about short game right like where did like i learned all of the concepts that i have regarding putting and chipping um from you right like that's where the bedrock of my foundation of teaching short game came from but what about you like where did you where did you you know and like come upon all of these words of these gems of wisdom that you've been able to kind of pass over to me and just to all your students? Well, when I grew up, I played golf first in a town of called West Plains, Missouri. We had a nine hole course and there was a lady that taught the junior golf program and she was a great player. And I know that just starting with her, she taught us a great grip. And I'm amazed at how simple it is to give somebody a good grip, but often they don't even know what that means. <laughs> right. But when I was 13, my dad and I were playing in a little scramble tournament and we met a gentleman named Ken Lanning. And Mr. Lanning became my mentor. The interesting thing is he was never a golf pro. He was just an amateur player that played at a pretty high level when he was young, but later in life, he just ran a real estate business, but he really donated his life to helping kids play golf better. And he shared his friends with me. So I went to Popper Bluff. Mr. Lanning was in Rolla. I went to Popper Bluff and saw Jim Parkins. He really showed me how to hit a wedge. A gentleman from St. Louis named Jim Tom Blair gave me a putting lesson. So my foundation came from hanging out with older amateurs that were champion players and they shared their wisdom mm -hmm. and it's interesting how good golf gets handed down absolutely and it's it's amazing I it's amazing too when um for those listening stan came um we were blessed this past summer stan came and did a, a one-day clinic with me at the golf room here in columbus um, and I don't know if you remember exactly what the quote is, and I don't want to put you on the spot, Stan, but one of the main highlights that, that I took away from that, um, from that, that school that we did together was how you were reflecting back on the writings of like, the writing was in like 1875 or some crazy time period, like 1850 or 1875. And it was in a putting book and a short game book. And you're like, this is exactly what we're teaching, right? Like to the point of what you're saying, like it's passing down and we're not reinvent. You're not reinventing physics or like gravity or anything else. You're just, this is the way that this is the way that you do it, right? Like it's, it's almost, it, it kind of defends itself because it stood the t test of time. Do you remember what, what, what was that book called or what was, do you happen to remember that quote off the top of your head? Well, the, the interesting thing is I went to the book because my friend Brandel mentioned he had studied putting being passed down by the legends of, of the golf and the stroke was handed down 
through different pl- people. Mm-hmm. One of the people he mentioned was Horton Smith. Well, Horton Smith grew up in Missouri and he won the first Masters, and I happen to have his putting book. Within that book, he quotes Sir W.G. Simpson, who wrote The Art of Golf in 1887. And the quote goes something like this It says, Good putting could be done by combined use of all arm joints. Mm -hmm. And so many people that we teach, their model is the opposite. It is restriction of arm joints instead of use of arm joints. And rock and block. Just (laughs) catching up on a couple words like that and making them word specific sometimes really changes somebody's attitude. Yeah. And I think that when I, when I first met you, it was amazing because I'll never forget it. We were, you gave me a putting lesson. It was out at Greyhawk. Um, Ben had done it and you were, you know, you were nice enough and spent an hour with me and I had, couldn't rub two nickels together. And you're like, Hey, just come hang out. I want to help. Um, I know I charged you double. (laughs) And I know that, um, I just remember being there. And the first thing that we did is you go, you, you had me take my three iron, right? Put it off my right foot, grab it with my right hand. And kind of like, you're like, I was hitting warm ups, and then you're like, all right, I got to fix this. So you took my three iron or it was maybe a hybrid put it off my right foot and I kind of start like hitting these table tennis like top shots and I hold I hold all of them from like 10 feet and you go yeah you should just fuck like that you're better and I remember just but I remember being like to your point so um almost like dumped in a pool of ice water because it was like this is so much different than everything I thought like I always thought it was like okay I gotta be like really tight and like just like rock my shoulders and like you know no like there's no art to this at all like it's got to be very mechanical and it's really not like you really brought it to life. The fact that putting and short game in general is just an art form. I mean, you're essentially a present day Picasso, but instead of holding a paintbrush, you're holding a putter, right? And when you play, like, and I'm telling the listeners too, because I've had the luxury of playing with Stan, you know, at TPC Scottsdale um, and Greyhawk. And when you play, it is so artistic, right? And it just looks so free and so soft. I mean, it's, it's really, honestly, it's like poetry in motion when you're putting. So, but it's amazing how all of these things kind of continue to get passed down, right? So, and, um, and your your story reminds me of giving a lesson yesterday. I gave a lesson to a college player, but his grandfather was observing. And one of the most powerful moments, as we have as coaches, is when we can see the observer understand what we just gave the student. Right. And I kind of gave the, the the student the same tap the ball drill like you'd knock a ball off the mm-hmm. off the green instead of being robotic. Right, right. And the grandfather just lit up because he he saw that happen to his grandson. Yeah. Yeah, and I think I think that this would be co- cool just to talk a little bit and tell you cuz you probably don't even you might not even remember it, but I'm going to tell you a little bit. These are my two um my two like the first one was my the 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 freedom thing, and then my other two like m- mat like major memory moments that I had with you as a player was when the first one was when me and Kevin Streelman were practicing on the back, and this is more of a this is a this is more of an articulation of your character and just how you're essentially as a coach you are very much a player's coach, right? Like you teach the feels of coming in as a player because you were an amazing player in yourself, which we'll get to in a minute, but. We were at the back of TPC Scottsdale, and it was a Monday, and you came back to hit balls with us at the back of TPC Scottsdale, and we're like, hey, Stan, like, how's it going? You're like, oh, it's good. I'm, I'm warming up. I'm hitting a few balls. We're like, oh, like, what are you practicing for? You're like, I'm going out to play. I have a tournament coming up. And we're like, oh, what tournament was it or is it? And you're like, it's the BMW uh, charity event out in South Carolina. You know, and that, that tournament, for those that are listening, has like, what, three courses, I think. And we said, and we looked at it, we go, but Stan, that, that tournament's in like a day and a half. Like, aren't you going to go out there? You go, nah, it's okay. Like yardage is yardage. And I was like, that's it. There's so much truth to that. in the fact that a 150 yard shot is a 150 yard shot. And the only thing that changes the 150 yard shot is us. Like we change, but I mean, you are as cool as the other side of the pillow or you're just like, it's fine. 150, like, I'm just going to hit it where I see it. And like. It's all good. And I was like, oh, this is amazing, right? So that's one of my, uh, it's kind of like, it's a great illustration of just you as being a player and a player's coach and just very like, yeah, just, you know, just do this. It was awesome. 
<laughs> I, I I think my wife would have told you I'd already transitioned into coach by then. I wouldn't like that as a player. <laughs> yeah, it's amazing how we change as uh, as we continue to go. So being a player there, so you go you go on tour in nineteen or you turn professional in nineteen eighty four, if I if I remember right. And then in nineteen eighty nine, was that that's when you got your your PGA Tour card. I mean, thinking of how much different the PGA Tour is now compared to when you played, you know, and got out there. Was that in, in 1989? Like, how much different is it now with all of the stuff going on? Because right now we've got in the midst of, like, PGA Tour and Live Tour and purses and media and all that kind of stuff. I mean, what's your insight just kind of, like, on the state of the tour now compared to when it was back when you were, when you were on it? Well, I, I probably shouldn't talk about the state of the tour now because <laughs> I feel removed, but yeah, it's interesting. The PGA media guide has never gotten it right about how I got on tour. So I was, I was not on tour in 1989. Okay. What year was it? I was playing state opens and mini tour golfs in 1989. I just happened to get an exemption into a PGA tour event and oh, won the tour event. That's right. In Chattanooga. So, so when I won, I was not on tour. So you were a Monday qualifier. Can you tell us a little bit about that story? Well, it's, it goes back to 88. Okay. And I, I, I told this story recently, but I'd kind of already forgotten it. But in 88, I went to Chattanooga and played the Monday qualifier. And I was, I was paired in the morning wave. So I played pretty good. And then I went back to my friend's house where I was staying and just hung out and thought I'd go back and see what the scores look like in the afternoon. I miscalculated that in the afternoon, people quit playing when they can't shoot the score. So when I pulled up in the parking lot, I was supposed to be on the first tee in the playoff. So I grabbed my driver, didn't even put my shoes on. My buddy's got my clubs in my shoes, and I ran to the tee, and I hit the drive. Oh, <laughs> and I think I birdied the first hole anyway. I got in the, I got in the Monday qualifier, and I made, the, I made the qualifier. So in 88, I got to play the Chattanooga Classic, made the cut, and shot the low score on Sunday, which I don't think I finished real high in the tournament, but I did have a good round. Yeah. So that helped me lobby for an exemption in 89. And then 89, I went there on an exemption. Kind of the, it's a big, long story how the week shook out, but I ended up being paired in the last group with John Daly. <laughs> we had a four-shot lead, and he was also playing on an exemption. You see, John didn't get on tour till 90. Yep. So at the end of the day, I birdied the last two on Sunday and won by a shot. Awesome. That's incredible. And and that's that's how I got on tour. So I tell these young people that are struggling that don't really have status. I said sometimes it just takes one good week. Yep. Yep. And like speaking of of Strillman, it like I remember he actually just talked about this in Golf Digest like in the January issue, but you know, sometimes it's just the a luck of the break, right? I think he talks about how he he birdied his last four holes in second stage for him to end up getting his card and then like he never lost it. You know, sometimes you just, you know, winning requires luck a little bit, you know, if we're being honest, but then you go on tour and you set. I got, I got, I got to add one to the Strillman story. Yeah. Our first lesson was that fall before tour school with, <laughs> with Kevin, with Kevin and I. Yeah. So when he went on that streak in Vegas and then tour school and got his card, I was his putting coach. That's awesome. Look at you. That's awesome. And then because you said when you were on tour then too, you you set a you set a record that I don't know if this I don't think it's been been, been broken. I don't think it could be broken, but in the, I, I think I think it's been tied. Has it been tied? And can you tell a little bit about that? Where was that at? So you, you go and you play yeah. nine holes and nine holes. You have six putts. Is it six putts? Was it six in nine holes? Which is just insane. <laughs> I mean, so I I was I was winding down my PGA Tour career. I got in the Vancouver tournament on the PGA Tour in 2003 based on the fact that I was still eligible to commit to tournaments because I was a past champion. And prior to going to Vancouver, I was in Colorado helping my brother move. And I kind of tweaked my back, and then I got in the tournament on, like, Monday afternoon, so I had to get to Vancouver by Thursday. Mm-hmm. 
So I really showed up at the tournament kind of beat up. And uh, you're Thursday, having to really I, apply this yardage is yardage right now. That's right. Thir- thir- Thursday, I played mediocre, and Friday morning, I came out and I hold a bunker shot on, I think, number three or four. I made a putt on five from off the green, and then I hold another bunker shot on seven. <laughs> And I realized when I walked off seven green, I'm like, I've only had four putts. <laughs> so I go to eight and it's a par four. That's just literally a drive it down the hill and wedge it over a lake, a pond with a wedge. But I drove it in the rough and the rough was so deep. I literally had to chip back in the fairway because I didn't think I could hit it over the pond out of the lot that I had. Yeah. So then I proceeded to miss the green short sided duffed a chip and then chipped it a foot and tapped in for a one putt. So I'm like, okay, it's a double, but I had a one putt. Right. <laughs> and then number number nine was about a 220 yard par three downwind. And I hit a nine wood at six feet and made it. Amazing. That's crazy. Now, the, the rest of that story is I know for sure I set a record on that nine that nobody talks about. <laughs> And that record would be the most shots anybody's ever hit on nine holes from off the green and broke par because I only shot one under. I hit 29 shots from off the green. <laughs> That's hilarious. That's so fun. Um, so I, pr- I, I promised the guys that had six putts and tied my record shot better than one under. Hey guys, I hope you are enjoying this episode of the Stock Shot Secrets Podcast. If you are enjoying it, be sure to like this episode. Be sure to subscribe so you can always see when they're coming out. And most importantly, if you would be so kind to be able to share this podcast with other passionate golfers who are trying to get better and build Stock Shots because it grows through you sharing it. Thank you so much for tuning in. And now back to Stock Shot Secrets. Right. Were you always a good putter or was this was it, was it an art that like you grew into? I mean, I was... Growing up, like I was an all right putter. I wouldn't say I was, you know, I wasn't bad, but I wasn't great. But I mean, you know, now, thanks to you, like it's one of my things where I go, you know, if I'm not making putts, it's not to put blame, but it's like these greens, it must be the greens. Like I don't know what it is. Right. So, like, where is it that? Or or, or you're off. Like we can get off and putt bad, but we don't putt terrible when we're on. Right. So, was it always that way for you? Or like, did you just kind of come out of the womb putting well? Or was it something, was it a, was it a, a skill that you acquired over time just through mentors so, and coaching and whatnot. I, I grew up <clears throat> intending to be a professional basketball player. So I knew how to manage the ball in my hand with either hand. Mm-hmm. I could shoot left-handed as a little boy. Uh, and I played a lot of ping pong before I played golf. So I had good hand-eye coordination. And I just putted them in. And I, I remember being a good putter. I don't know what that means. Right. But it wasn't until my sophomore year of college was over that Mr. Lanning and, Mr. and Jim Tom Blair gave me a putting lesson. So I went from being a good putter because I just believed I was a good putter to actually understanding how to make a good stroke. Yeah, I think there's a lot of truth in that, too. Like, I think, um, well, it's always interesting. Like, if I talk to a client who's coming in town – um, you know, and I was like, yeah, we're going to do some putting. And I was like, so how's your putting? I would say 99% of players are like, I'm a good putter. And I'm like, but you're like, you're a good putter relative to what? Like, you mean like you don't put it in the pond from 10 feet? Because <laughs> a driver, like when you hit a driver bad, you know, right? But <laughs> That's like, right. You lose it. <laughs> right. You know, but most people, it's kind of like the old stat of like 80% of drivers think they're above average drivers, which obviously is not possible. So it's kind of like 80% of putters thinks they're above, above average putters. And there's so much, to your point, like when you were here, you go, you can become a better putter by just hitting your first putt closer. Right? It's like, <laughs> so what, what is it just being on the lesson tee and, and teaching for all of these years now? Like, what would you say if you were giving some advice to the listeners at home, right? Being stock shot secrets and obviously these the, most of these listeners are passionate golfers wanting to get better. What are some things, like one or two things that you seem to plague the everyday golfer that it's like you know you're giving a lesson they're coming out to arizona to greyhawk or or to, to colorado and it's like okay like i'm gonna give this lesson again this is like the hundred millionth time i'm gonna do this right like what are some of those reoccurring themes that you see well one i try never have the attitude you just took 
<laughs> you were heckling me, I know, but but it's 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 humorous and it's exciting to share with somebody the truth versus what they don't understand is the truth. Hundred uh, percent. First off, I would say that people have beliefs that are conscious and subconscious. So I always try to get at the core of what that is, because one, they hear bad information, and two, golf is counterintuitive. Mm -hmm. So, like, I love to say, people's brains always are analyzing a task. So the golfer gets the task of hitting a golf ball wrong very often in their mind. Now, to go directly to your question, people think they're supposed to keep their head down. People think they're supposed to accelerate at the ball. People think they're supposed to fall through toward the target. Mm -hmm. And even yesterday with a couple good players, they were stroking the face square to the hole in the follow through. I'm like, that is completely logical, but it's really bad math. <laughs> right. And, you know, I, my afternoon lesson was an older gentleman. And I was like, you're completely bound up by what you're watching on YouTube. Yeah. Yeah. That information is good for somebody, but most of it's not good for you. Right. Right. It's amazing. It's amazing. Some of those concepts that the, that's kind of just, filtered through the golf lingo of amateurs when they play like, Oh, I decelled and like all these things. And it's like, no, that's not, no, it doesn't, that's not even real. Like that's true. <laughs> stop, stop saying that. Um, so what about, so you've worked, you're obviously working with like everyday passionate golfers coming out to Arizona. There's, there's, there's certainly guys like me trying to beg for some time with you so that you can revolution my game back in, you know, 2012 or so. But what about like, you've had a, you've had a history of, Working with some really, really cool, really cool, you know, tour players. Obviously, you. Um, I'd like to dive a little bit into the story, if it's okay, of working with Charles Barkley and taking away the, taking away the hitch and making it so that he can perform. But, um, you know, what were some of the, like, you know, I, I think the big influence that, if I remember, if I'm remembering right, was Jay Haas, right? And then you had a little time with Sergio, but. You know, what are some of the things, how is it different when you're teaching a tour player relative to like maybe teaching an amateur? Do you feel like there is a difference when you're teaching them compared to a tour player or does it seem to be similar? I think most of it is similar. The, the risk of messing up a tour player is high. Right. So you can take a little more liberty with an amateur to make a bigger change, which they sometimes need. Right. At the sacrifice of maybe having them struggle for a moment. Yeah. A tour, a tour player needs to get it immediately. And what they, about, they what, don't have time. To, they don't have time to struggle. And how did the, how did the story kind of, how did it work with, in regards to Charles Barkley? Like, how did it, how did it originate? How did you guys, were you guys acquaintances before? Was it a blind call? And then really the process of like you taking away the, the hitch. <laughs> so Charles lives in Scottsdale. <clears throat> So I had crossed paths with him a handful of times over the years. And he really is the most impressive person about how to meet other people I've ever been around. So, you know, he, he acted like he had met me before, but we bumped into each other before the first lesson at Tom Lehman's charity event here in town. We were both playing. And... I just said, I'd love to watch you hit balls sometime. And he's like, oh, everybody's watched me hit balls. I'm like, well, I haven't. He said, I guess that's true. So we traded numbers, and he called me about Thanksgiving. It's been five years ago. Mm -hmm. Seems like the other day. but uh, And he came to Greyhawk, and we hit balls on the back of the range, him and I, him and, I and my, bro my son, Jake. And... I tried to get at what he was thinking and what he was doing, but I don't think he really understood. And literally, uh, this, this is a side note to all this, but I took a lesson from John Jacobs on Long Island or Michael Jacobs on Long Island a couple years ago. Yep. And he explained to me the balance point of a club and the fact that a club teeter totters around the balance point of the club. And that really 
applied to Charles because Charles pulled the grip down toward the ground and the ball so hard that as long as the grip's going down, the club head can't pass. Mm -hmm. Club head stays up if the grip's going down. Right. So I really taught him how to tip the shaft earlier so that the head went backwards and down in the downswing instead of if you pull down on the grip the head goes forward again Mm -hmm. so he he couldn't get the head to go backwards in the downswing it's almost like it's almost like charles had too much lag (laughs) you know well i i think he was taught lag improperly right right lag is not the shaft lag is the arms yep and uh, most people miss the fact that when they swing the club back, pretty much at parallel to the ground on the back, back swing is the farthest the club head ever gets from the target. Yep. The, re- the remainder of the back swing, the club head is circling back toward the target. So they, they lose the fact that the club head needs to circle away from the target on the downswing. Uh-huh. So I like to say I release the club backwards and down before I swing forward. Yeah, so it would be and, and, which would which and that, So right. we, me me and you and everybody else that struggles, we swing forward but we forgot to swing the club back the direction it came from. Yeah. And when I showed him that one little move, he heard that message and he went to work. Yeah. And I, I've still only been with Charles five or six times to hit balls in five years. Mm-hmm. We we have not spent hours. He has spent hours working at it, and I give him credit for practicing hard. Yeah, it's amazing how they if they get if you kind of you know you hear these messages of what it is, and it's it's like that just that that resonated with him of like oh I gotta like I gotta swing the club head, which is very similar to what you are teaching inside putting and short game, right? Like we don't want to be swinging yeah, the grip. It, like we want to be swinging. It's all the same. Yeah. It's all the same. And uh, and I, I do, I do have to mention one thing. People tried to get me to explain how I helped his mental game. Charles didn't have a mental problem. He had a skill problem. He's a mental beast. Yeah. And he's a ridiculous athlete. So when I got the club swinging, his athleticism could find the face and hit a shot that he could go chase. Right. I didn't have to show him all that. Yeah, you can't he's be a great. He's a great athlete with a you, great mind. Yeah, you can't do what he did in the game of basketball and be mentally weak. Like he's no. Yeah, it's impossible. And and even the the students that come see us and they say they're confident, they lack confidence. I'm like. Your skill deserves no confidence in golf. <laughs> I said it's not a confidence problem. <laughs> it's a skill problem, and you and I, Kyle, can help their skill. Right. <laughs> How do that you should t- make them? That should make them feel better. They they think something's wrong on the inside. Yeah. Like Bernhard Langer took a bunch of grief because he said. Golf was not mental the other day. Did you see that? I did not see that. And his point was, no matter who you are almost, you can't mentally beat me at golf ever because my skill is more than yours. Yep. It's only a mental contest within the group that have the skills. Mental contest, can you explain that a little bit more? Meaning like when you're when you're playing with peers well, of similar like, well like when you go play with a guy that's a 20 handicap, if golf was mental, he would have a chance to beat you. Right, right. But he never <laughs> has a chance to beat you. Right. <laughs> golf is a physical game. Yeah. It has mental aspects, but if you if you don't have the physical, you can't out mental a guy that's better than you skill wise. Yep, yep. And now, just like as, because um, you and I, like when we were in, as we kind of wrap up in our last couple minutes, um, two final questions. Like you and I, when we had, when I was living in Scottsdale, um, and we were out there, my wife and I, and we had Adler was born out there. I mean, you were an instrumental part of my life 
not just really, I mean, yes, for the putting in the short game, but really more for just, like, the talks that we're having right now, like the reformation of the hearts and just, you know, you and I were in a Bible study together and we did a lot of stuff. I mean, how do you, as a man of faith, like, how do you put that into context into in regards to do, what you're doing on the lesson tee, right? Like, how do you see that as like your calling and how you, how you work that into what you're doing? And then at the same time, I guess I'll parlay that to a second question with all of, and this is really talking second as a secondary question to the teachers that are listening, that are the young aspiring like golf pros and they're doing this stuff. It's very time demanding. So, you know, I always like to ask the question of like, how did you go through your career and try to, and, and do and, and balance all of it, right? Like balance the lesson T and balance being a husband and, balancing being a father to your two kids and like all those things, right? How did you find the balance? So those, those two part question. So we have an hour, right? Uh, we have like another 10, 15, 10 minutes. Like you could just, you could go on a, on a tangent for an hour. <laughs> so <clears throat> I'm going to start with, I grew up going to church and having a strong Christian faith. Even as a young 13, 14, 15-year-old person, I would sit in church and wrestle with, I'm dreaming about a career that works on Sunday. Like, that was a mental conflict mm -hmm. of mine. Mm -hmm. uh, so, human humanizing it, we justify, well, I will have a platform. And so, I became a pro my platform had me asked to speak at an FCA breakfast, Fellowship of Christian Athlete Golf Breakfast. And then I remembered, my dad said, son, you should take speech. I was like, dad, I'm too scared to talk in front of people to take speech. Right. So all of a sudden, <clears throat> God has put me in a place that I asked for and I'm ill prepared. Because I do not want to get up and talk. And I'm telling this story because this really changed the course of my speaking career. Mm -hmm. I asked God, what should I do? And inside my spirit, I heard, you enjoy being interviewed. Interview yourself. So every time I give a talk, I just write the questions down on a piece of paper that I think my audience wants me to answer. And I take the stage and interview myself. Mm -hmm. I literally just get up and say, I think you guys want me to answer. How did I teach Charles Barkley? Yeah. So I lead myself into the, into the question that I want to answer. Which is a great lesson so, for, which is a great lesson too, just in regards of like teaching on the lesson T, right? Like if you were the student, what would you, like, what would I ask? What would I ask me? Right. And then you just, you, you start knocking, our, you, you just start knocking down those internal and external false beliefs and questions. Right. Yeah. Because our, our students, <clears throat> they don't know the right questions to ask. So sometimes we have to tee up the questions for them. Mm -hmm. And then kind of how did I balance life? I got married pretty young. My wife and I chose to travel together when we played tour golf. And a lot of that was mini tour golf. When we had a family, both my kids were on the road within two weeks of birth. Mm -hmm. We traveled as a family. and all the way up until the time of our oldest needed to go to second grade. We homeschooled, not because we were homeschoolers, just because we wanted to stay together, mm -hmm. kindergarten and first grade for our oldest. And so I chose to take my family with me. And I don't regret any of that. We're yeah. all still very close. Yeah, amazing family. Well, Stan, thank you so much, buddy, for coming on and sharing your words of wisdom. Thank you for all, everything you did for me personally. 
um, and basically giving me a bedrock to not only become a great putter and a great player, but then really just helping form me into like the person I am today and the teacher I am today. Um, so thank you so much for joining. And I'll see you, I guess I'll see you in a, about a week or two when we go down to the show. Because right now when we're recording this, it's the beginning of January. So I'll see you hopefully in a couple weeks. All right. It was fun. Let's do it again. Thanks, buddy. Have a great day. Thank you. Hey, guys, thank you so much for listening to the latest episode of the Stock Shot Secrets. Now, I want to give you a special opportunity where you and I can chat individually by just simply texting the following number. And you can ask any question under the sun about anything relative to your game or your skill, body, mind, whatever it is. So just text me at 614-541-1988. That's 614 614- 5411988 subscribe to our text line and then you can be in the special stock shot community where we can talk about everything under the sun regarding stock shots